Okay, welcome uh, to this first session in the afternoon of uh, Monday. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, John Cherry, who is going to uh, present us uh, a new project uh, uh, having to do with uh, uh, internet and uh, groundwater and uh, hydrogeology and, and sharing and, and cloud sharing uh, uh, stuff. Mm, John Cherry doesn't need any presentation beyond the fact that uh, he is the co-author of the famous book uh, Freeze and Cherry, Groundwater Hydrogeology. So please give an applause to John Cherry. Well, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be at this meeting. I had a chance to present and I always enjoy IH meetings because it's meetings from people all over the world. It's a great relief to not be in a meeting where everyone's concerned with trichloroethylene. No one's ever died from trichloroethylene, but it certainly has occupied the attention of many of the hydrogeologists in the developed countries. So I'm going to tell you about a project here that um, has come about. And I'll tell you about the project and I'll tell you about how it came about. And I'm leading this project, but basically I'm with a team of people and the project evolves and it, it, uh, it gets expanded and gets bigger uh, and the people on this list are encouraging this. Uh, the steering committee work with me kind of daily or weekly on this uh, and the members of the advisory committee, their main job is to make sure that, that insanity doesn't break out. This is the steering committee. Uh, Four retired uh, professors and uh, three people who are still working, uh, academics and two people from the private sector. So the philosophy of this project, we call the Groundwater Project, is that knowledge should be free and the best knowledge is free knowledge. And uh, that certainly should be the case uh, for water. So we're proceeding with that as the, as the premise. And the mission is the democratization of groundwater knowledge for education. That's the mission. And the goals here are very broad, to deliver online assemblage of learning materials about groundwater science and engineering to support student learning, professionals in groundwater science and engineering, and specialists in other disciplines, and managers and regulators. So we're claiming here uh, to put together educational materials for basically everybody. And the aim is to make groundwater learning accessible, independent of money, location, and prerequisite knowledge. And furthermore then, uh, the claim here is that the scope will be encyclopedic, uh, but focused on learning. And encyclopedic just refers to the fact that we hope to cover everything that one would ever ask about in terms of groundwater, but not with just information. The issue here is is can we get information together which will allow us to learn and to understand. So we're, we're in the process then of, of getting set to produce a series of, of e-books and related learning products uh, for science, groundwater science and engineering on all topics that are scientifically significant and are relevant to societal needs. And the products will be free of charge, electronic only, no print. Um, the groundwater book that was referred to then has already been crowdsourced for translations. So we're hoping that the new educational materials will also be translated relatively quickly using modern methods of translation and crowdsourcing. And the groundwater project aims to fill immense gaps between research journals and synthesize knowledge for education. And research journals, I'm sure as you all know, are becoming increasingly incomprehensible unless you're the person who wrote the paper uh, or uh, are in, in, in the detailed area of the, of the paper topic, the chances are that you, you won't understand it all that well. And that's the way science has to progress. So the referee journals are essential because they advance the science in an effective and fair manner. So in no way am I complaining about the referee journal process. We, we need that. But the referee journals have no obligation to educate by knowledge synthesis. And the, and the referee journals are biased, of course, towards the affluent countries to the detriment of the, of the developing countries. 
And here's a pile of textbooks that I pulled up on the table a number of years ago and photographed them, and I use them in a variety of talks, usually to criticize them in a variety of ways. So here I'm saying that conventional textbooks are not much help for nearly all types of grammar to learn and problem solving. And many studies have shown that students don't learn very much from textbooks. But of course, we need textbooks uh, to have the basic uh, knowledge recorded. The general purpose of getting educated is so you can understand the textbooks, not use the textbooks to achieve understanding. Um, and the other problem with textbooks in the groundwater field is they trivialize, they trivialize uh, groundwater uh, as a science. So if anyone looks at a groundwater textbook, you'll see a number of topics covered. And the real world of, of groundwater science uh, is so broad and so rich and so, so sophisticated. Now, why are so few groundwater education books published? Well, the complexity, scope, and intensity of the science has become too large for a few individuals to understand well enough to accomplish censuses across a wide scope. So the main issue here is how do you get from research published in, re in referee journals how do you get to synthesis? The synthesis is what we need to, to understand. Now, the Grammar Project is organized in knowledge domains, and the domains grow from week to week uh, as we learn and find out about more topics, etc. Currently, we have 45 domains, and each domain will have, say, five to 50 chapters, uh, and there are 80 chapters already uh, underway. And the next long uh, table then shows you a whole bunch of domains, and we need to read them, but you just kind of look at it. Uh, so just about anything that is important in groundwater today, or just about any scientific topic that maybe isn't yet seen to be important, uh, but which is scientifically interesting, fits into uh, one of these domains, and I'll come back to a couple of these domains in a moment. So what we're trying to do is take the, the grand scope of groundwater science, and, and the interactions of groundwater with just about everything that matter, like ecology and, and society, etc. We're trying to take all of those and get them fitted into, into uh, domains and chapters uh, and, uh, and then see if we can actually get written material uh, uh, to, uh, to go with it. And, and here's a schematic of this project. Um, so we're claiming then that not only will we synthesize all the scientific information, we're claiming that we will synthesize it in a way that is understandable uh, to the beginning student, uh, but we're not going to uh, trivialize it so that uh, the beginning student needs to understand it, but we also want it to be meaningful and understandable uh, to mid-level students on up into a more advanced level. And then how do you do that? Well, we'll need videos and lab experiments and all sorts of things so the material can be, can be understood. So the claim here is that we're going to leave nobody, nobody behind and have lots of opportunity then for people to learn further up the ladder if that's what they want. And, and in general, textbooks are written uh, by professors who want to write about what they know a lot about. And of course, that's, uh, and generally students learn then about what we know a lot about. Uh, and that means then that the written material that we have access to tends to, tends to focus on past, past knowledge that's become mature. But another claim of this project is that we're, we're going to try and treat the newest information. We're going to treat science that you might say is speculative. And one might say, well, why would you want to write about speculative science? Well, speculative science is where many of the most important things are happening. Uh, and speculative science becomes mature once it's recognized that it's worth working on, etc. And of course, to learn, one needs all sorts of you know, different materials. One needs work problems, problems with answers that are not worked, you know, video lectures, case study examples, multiple explanations, and uh, local field examples. And you know, the question is, well, how, how do we learn? How can people learn? Uh, people learn in different ways from different types of material in the hopes that we will assemble lots of different types of material from across the globe uh, that will help people learn about groundwater uh, wherever they live. If they live in a tropical climate or an arid climate or whatever. So this is a grand vision, and I'm not taking claim for the vision here. I'm representing the vision. The vision has stumbled along and it's gotten to a certain point through a series of events. And so I'll tell you about the 
fortuitous events that have led to this vision. Um, the first event was Al Fries and I meeting at a uh, meeting at a geological site of America a convention in the United States back in 1975. And I was the first groundwater professor in Canada. So a Canadian university put out an ad at the University of Manitoba in 1967 that they wanted to hire a hydrogeologist. And it was amazing that they did that, and I got the job because I was the only applicant. I was the only person who submitted an application claiming to have received some sort of education in hydrogeology. And Alfred, I think, was probably the third uh, Canadian professor to fill a hydrogeologic position. And we were both writing textbooks because the textbooks that were available in the mid-70s weren't suitable for the type of teaching he wanted to do. And so we went one day at a, a GSA meeting, and Al said he was writing a book, and I said I was writing a book, and we decided then to write a book together, and that he would write the physical part, and I'd write the chemical part, 50-50. Uh, and the book was crammed full with all sorts of stuff, because we wanted to cover everything, and the publisher would only allow us to have uh, 600 pages. So it's a very compact, concise, crammed full book, it's not very good for learning, but it has served its purposes. So why did it remain in print for so long? Well, it, made, it remained in print for so long, I guess, because it was crammed full of, of stuff, uh, and it was crammed full with information that was concise and, and reasonably clear, some people uh, tell me. Um, so it, it basically remained in, in print uh, then because it was concise uh, and had, had good clarity. And the only reason it went out of print is that I requested the publisher to give us the publication rights back uh, a few years ago. They were going to continue on publishing it forever because people were still buying it. And as a sort of philanthropic act then, we asked the publisher to give us the rights back so we could start a new venture, which we call Groundwater 2.0. We were going to expand this book and, uh, and, uh, and, and put it out there again. So uh, why were Fries and Cherry capable of creating such a where we see a book. Um, and the answer is because there was so little knowledge existed in the 1970s, and Fries and Cherry knew enough about many topics to produce a Broadscape book. Those were the good old days where there was only one journal that published papers on groundwater. You hardly had to read a book or two because there weren't many. Uh, and so, in order to be very knowledgeable what was known about groundwater at that time, you really didn't have to read very much. And I figured I read just about everything of relevance when I was working on Fries and Cherry. I thought I read about just about everything relevant on the topic that I was treating that was published in English language. That was how shallow groundwater science was at that time. So why were Fries and Cherry not capable of producing a revised edition? So we were, in, we were in our late 30s when we produced the original textbook, and a decade later people were saying, well, why don't you produce a second edition, as people normally do after 10 years? The fact of the matter is they concluded that we weren't capable of doing that. Um, and we were still relatively young, we were in our 40s. So what, what were we concluding when we concluded there was no way that we could do it? We concluded we couldn't do it because groundwater science had advanced so much that we lacked the expert knowledge to cover but a few of the many important topics in groundwater science. Um, to cover them in the way that we thought it needed to be covered. So the science had gone beyond us, and we were both very active in research, we were both publishing papers, but we become narrower and narrower and narrower to the point where most of us can only claim that we're experts in a very narrow domain. Now, uh, the Groundwater Project was instigated by pressure on me to get this book revised. So a, a colleague, Dr. Catherine Ryan at the University of Calgary, kept bugging me for years uh, to do something. And she said, you know, we'll get together a bunch of people, we'll do something, we'll, take, maybe we'll make it a Wikipedia book, but you gotta do something. And that's what kind of kicked uh, all of this off. Um, with me doing nothing more than worrying about it. Now, to produce a chapter on a topic to educate at levels ranging from uh, beginning to advanced it requires expert knowledge. So that's the premise. If we're going to synthesize the science that exists today, and if we're going to simplify it and get it clear, then we want to be sure that, that we get it clear correctly. It's not all that difficult to synthesize complicated stuff so that it's simple uh, and wrong. Now something happened, I was awarded the Lee Kuan Yew Water Prize in 2016, and this was kind of a turning point. This prize is granted from uh, Hong Kong in honor of its founding uh, Prime Minister, uh, and it was very pleasant. I, I was uh, given a check for $250,000, uh, 
And I got to have dinner with the Prime Minister at a big banquet, and all that was great fun. But what, what wasn't fun, though, was answering, I was having all the media interviews. So they made a big deal of it, and there were television interviews, and there were magazine interviews, and there were newspaper interviews. And, and that's a painful process, because, because explaining groundwater uh, to, to the media, as many of you know, is very difficult. And the media want to hear about things that they kind of understand, and they want to hear about things that are flashy and spectacular and whatnot. So I was asked in the midst of all of this, uh, what did I intend to do with, in the future um, that would be uh, significant in the next uh, few years? Oops, I've done something wrong here. Um, and so I blurted out that I would, uh, that I had this idea for an electronic book. And uh, I had an idea, but I wasn't doing anything. And I was asked, well, what's it going to cover? And I said, well, I think it'll cover everything. Um, and that was reported in the newspaper, and it was even reported again, you know, in a, in a, in a television interview. So I received the Lee Kuan Yew Prize, and that was all great, but then I left with this huge, huge problem of having made a promise to produce an electronic book that would cover everything in groundwater, and it would be suitable for all levels. Now, I'm going back to this list of domains here, uh, and when I say we want to cover everything at all levels, uh, the first book within a book, then, would be the lay be a lay introduction to groundwater science and engineering. So somehow we're going to have to manage to produce a book that could be read by non-experts, by, by your, your, your supervisors or your bosses or whatever. They likely aren't groundwater experts. Um, and, uh, and then we have a whole a series of 30 chapters in a, in a, in a domain called uh, Physical uh, Principles and Concepts. And that's where all the undergraduate stuff is going to be embedded. Uh, but much beyond whatever one would ever take in a normal undergraduate course. So everything that would seem to matter to groundwater science, etc., we will, we will put into chapters uh, at, this, at this introductory to intermediate uh, level. And let's take one of these chapters, for example. Let's take flow nets. So in the Freeze Cherry book, there's a chapter on flow nets, and it's about 10 pages long. And you would read about what a flow net is, but in no way would you ever be able to construct a flow net after reading that chapter. So when people tell me, you know, that the Freeze Cherry book was a wonderful book, I often wonder what are they talking about, because what did they actually learn? You couldn't learn to, to do a flow net, you can't learn to do almost anything. Um, but you could learn the kind of the general concepts of where you need to go. Now, Aline uh, Potter, a retired and distinguished professor at the Colorado School of Mines, then has taken on the job of producing a flow net chapter where if you read the chapter and use the software and do the exercise, you'd actually know an awful lot about flow nets. The software is available, the software is free, and it really does amazing stuff. So, for example, Al Fries' PhD thesis at the University of California, Berkeley, was basically just producing a series of flow net diagrams in steady state with hydraulic conductivity contrasts of only a factor of 100. And now students can do that and much more, even in just exercises. And when I was traveling in Hong Kong, through Hong Kong a few years ago, I noticed a little model in Jimmy Zhao's lab. It's a beautiful little elegant Healy Shaw model. It's only about, uh, you know, a half a meter long, etc. And you put dye into it, and in front of your eyes, you see a flow net developed. And you can manipulate the model, you can manipulate the boundary conditions. And in front of your eyes, you can learn an awful lot about flow nets. And so in this flow net chapter, to make it educational then, we'll basically have these flow nets produced with these dye experiments. And the hope would be that these, these, these uh, little models that are made in China would become available everywhere. And then you can simulate them. So the grand hope would be that if you read the flow nets chapter and use the software and use the models, you really understand flow nets. That's, that's the hope. Now why is the groundwater project urgent? It's urgent because groundwater development and protection and management today suffers immensely from poor decision making based on ignorance of the existing groundwater knowledge. So it's not in general that we're lacking knowledge, although many countries we need more monitoring, etc. The knowledge we have is dispersed in and in general, we can't get our hands on it, etc. So there's, it's commonly said that we're in the midst of a, of a global water crisis. And every two or three years, a journalist writes a book on the global water crisis. And I usually uh, buy them and read them and, and, uh, and have a great disappointment. Water problems now circulate the globe. We're in the middle of a water crisis in the US and around the world. Here's one written by a Canadian author. The next 30 years, between the third and a half of 
The global population will live under severe water stress, which means living without water and basic needs. Wow. But these books don't emphasize the fact that all this is really about groundwater. Um, in one way or another, almost all these problems come back to groundwater problems. It's never kind of brought to the fore uh, by journalists and by people outside of our little discipline here, as was mentioned in the, in the keynote talk earlier today. And hardly anyone knows then that all fresh groundwater uh, pretty well is groundwater, and almost all the water flowing in rivers and lakes in one way or another uh, is, is part of the groundwater flow system. And what it even more and more frightening in a way, we're not prepared for the addition of three billion more people that can only make groundwater issues uh, more important. Uh, so groundwater needs recognition and uh, this can only be achieved through uh, education. And uh, the groundwater problem is global and it's worsening with no end in sight. And one of the big, big disappointments then is academia. So universities have become the worst enemy of hydrogeological education. Uh, in the UK, for example, a perfectly good world-leading hydrogeology program was cancelled because some dean, probably an arrogant physicist or whatever, decided to cancel it. Uh, and I hear this story from across the globe. If you're in California and you wanted to get a master's degree uh, learning an appropriate amount of information on hydrogeology, you wouldn't find a university in the great state of California that you could go to. So I think basically we're, all, we're worse off now in most countries in terms of groundwater education than we were uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. So why, why do universities not think that groundwater is important? Many universities don't even think it's important to have one groundwater professor, but almost none of them think it's important enough to have three groundwater professors, etc., etc. And, and we travel below the radar screen, and we're not taken seriously as a scientific discipline. And I could I understand all of that, but we're not even taken seriously as part of the global water crisis. So the Groundwater Project is aimed at bringing education to the fore. Uh, it's aimed at then showing that groundwater science is a very complex, uh, sophisticated, uh, interesting, challenging field. Uh, and I think once this project is up there on the website and whatnot, and people can see what groundwater science is, hopefully this will bring some respect uh, to uh, this profession that we're all in. So now you can say, okay, this grand vision then, it would seem to be almost an insane one, uh, where are we at? And so, believe it or not, we have more than 130 co-authors in 15 countries on six continents from 114 organizations that are actually preparing chapters. Uh, and so I'm, I'm able to sleep at nights now, uh, to some degree, after seeing this idea uh, actually start to, uh, to flourish. And so what would even make me believe that it was worth pursuing? Well, when I started, uh, two or three years ago, when I started to mention the idea to some prominent older hydrogeologists, everybody basically bought into it. And I began to receive chapters. So for example, very early on, I received a chapter from Stephen Foster. So when I found that my older colleagues believed in the idea well enough to actually send me chapters, then I was brave enough to go out start searching for more chapters. And now I'm asking younger people, and now we're getting commitments from people who are actually in, in, in peak, peak career. So I think it's, it's uh, really happening. So we've got uh, people participating from six continents, 15 countries, more than 130 participants, etc. Most at the moment from Canada and the US, you know, that's the starting point and that's where I'm best connected and whatnot so forth. But gradually we're working our way uh, into a more global, a more global realization. And we have participants from all of these countries and, and from more. So we're trying to go global and we're trying to get out there to find where the knowledge is and who could write to it, who can participate and who can help um, and whatnot. That's what we're uh, trying to do. But as I got going on this project and I began to invite older colleagues and older distinguished scientists from across the globe to participate, uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, and they are, uh, I then quickly realized that, that this endeavor in its own, if I was doing nothing more than trying to get the, the distinguished older groundwater scientists of the world to participate, if we did nothing more than that, it would be well worth it. And I've got authors who are over 80 in age doing really beautiful work, and when I look at their work, I think if they don't write it, nobody's going to write it. It's just like building a nuclear reactor. Like France can't build nuclear reactors anymore because all the people who know how to build them have retired. 
Canada got out of the nuclear field because we can't even repair our nuclear reactors. So there are many types of knowledge and, and experience that we get uh, that doesn't get passed on uh, unless we really work on it. So some of these wonderful chapters that we're receiving are being prepared by senior scientists who are the only people in the world that I think uh, could write the chapter. And sometimes when some of the really old person, people writing chapters don't communicate with me, uh, then I get worried, uh, as you might imagine. So when will chapters begin to appear on the Groundwater website? Well, uh, a dozen or two or three in early to mid-2020, and then by the end of 2020, uh, hopefully uh, another a few dozen, etc. And by the time this meeting happens in Brazil, a year from now then, we should be well underway, and I think we'll be able to use that meeting as a chance for many of the authors on some of the chapters and whatnot to get together uh, and help uh, plan things. So that's the grand vision, and I'm pleased to report that it's actually happening. I certainly don't want to take credit for the idea. The credit, the idea just kind of rambled along, and, and I kept on uh, keeping it going. Uh, I've had so many colleagues around the world who would then agree to contribute, and so basically that's buoying my spirits, and I think this uh, project is, is really happening. Thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. I'll just a comment here. There are a number of topics in groundwater science that very few people understand. And one of them is hydrodynamic dispersion. So if you've read the textbooks and you've looked at the math and you don't quite understand hydrodynamic dispersion, it's likely because you're just like, like all the rest of us. But we've got to write about transport and dispersion very clearly. So one of the things I did recently was put out the question, what do we mean by hydrodynamic dispersion? And I had a few other questions with it. And I put it out to a group of the people who are participating. And then there was a two-month dialogue from the most knowledgeable people in the world trying to explain what hydrodynamic dispersion is. And it was a wonderful intellectual journey uh, where I learned, hmm, this is another way we can use this project. At the end of the day, then, the explanations on hydrodynamic dispersion are going to be highly peer-reviewed. They're going to be the consensus from this, the most, uh, most esteemed people in the world who can write in that chapter. And I should mention that all these chapters are being peer-reviewed. So it's like, it's like a peer-reviewed journal. The, the, the document comes in, it goes out to two or three or four people for review, and some will be reviewed by maybe half a dozen people as we try and make sure that we're capturing the views from across the globe, that we're not just focused on developing countries, that we're not just focused on, uh, on human climates, etc. Anyway, I, that's a monologue while we're waiting for this question. <laughs> I'm Everton from the zoo. So I have two questions for you. First is, uh, what do you mean by chapters? Are there books, digital books? And second question is, uh, since this is a collaborative uh, endeavor, uh, how could people in this room and outside this room could uh, eventually collaborate to the project? Yeah, Everton's prompted me to, to, uh, to point out things that I should have pointed out anyway, very important. So a domain is kind of a theme. A domain might be like mathematical and numerical modeling that might have uh, be broken into chapters. A chapter is kind of a book-sized scientific entity. Uh, so, you know, when people said, well, John, what do you want? You want me to write something, what do you want? I said, well, write a chapter. Okay, and, and you know, write something that looks like a chapter. Uh, and then they began to send things in that look like a chapter, and now I'm changing the rules. Uh, no, 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 we don't want a conventional chapter, not like a conventional textbook. We want a chapter that has some simulations, that's more, that's more interesting, that's, that's, uh, uh, that has more layered, etc. So basically, a, a chapter is, is, a, is, a, is an entity that, 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 that we can get people to write to. In some cases, it's one person, but in usually, many cases, it's two or three people. Just, just so you can kind of get something happening. The domain, then, is a collection of chapters. Um, and so what's happening now is, is basically domains that start out with five chapters, some of them have gone up to you know, 20 chapters. And it's because science is reductive. And, and if you're going to understand something, then you can't skate over the surface. 
to understand things deeply, you gotta, you gotta dig deep. So you gotta dig deep, but then it has to be explained so that anyone picking up can read it. So we're faced with this problem of depth and, 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 and breadth uh, and synthesis um, and clarity. Yeah. And I'm told that, that, that that's what the Freeze and Cherry book did. Like I'm told that that's what it did. I guess I have to believe it because, you know, it, it's, it gets me a lot of compliments and it's been used for a long time. The problem was it was easy because there was so little information. Now, now to synthesize, it's more difficult. Yeah, but it's supposed to be, I'm supposed to be answering questions here. Oh, collaboration. Yeah. So, um, we, want, we want global engagement that allows this project to happen. So we need to use the brains and experience from around the world, but it can't happen instantaneously. So one of the early ideas was just make it a Wikipedia book. Just basically let people send in stuff from all over the world, like Wikipedia. The problem with that is when you go on Wikipedia, you don't know if an idiot wrote it or not. Uh, and Wikipedia, you know, it has some wonderful stuff, and we all use it all the time, but you don't know who wrote it. Um, and then it keeps changing. So we're trying to have a very tight control uh, on, on the peer review process and the information. But basically soon on the website, the, the grand design will be out there. And all the 500 chapters will be listed. All the topics will be listed that we want to work on. And most of them aren't being covered. So of the 500 chapters being, that I've listed and other people have helped me with, we probably have 150 that actually have people who, that I know or have volunteered with the knowledge to tackle them. So somehow in this global scheme of things, and certainly with the help of IH, we need to connect, you know, knowledgeable people to, to, to the topics. And in, in the, the, uh, uh, the keynote this morning was, was about this most important of all the topics and maybe most important in groundwater hydrology, MAR may be the most important right now. Basically all this fresh water is running off to the nearest lake or to the nearest ocean. And this is where hydrogeologists finally have an opportunity to enter into the whole picture of water management in a very serious way. Because the surface water hydrologists probably can't do MAR without our, without our help, or they would. Um, so anyway, we're trying to figure out then, how, does, how, how would anybody who wants to contribute um, get to contribute? And one well, way is... Thank you for the very interesting summary of the great project. Um, my question relates to your uh, point about depth and yeah. breadth. Um, I noticed that your audi target audiences, there was no mention of the sort of wider public. Um, do you have any comments on how we can raise awareness of groundwater to the wider public? Maybe your book isn't on this project, isn't the right place. Oh, to well, do that, but I believe yeah. it's a highly important. Um, Thing that we need to do. Yeah. So, so, so uh, basically, domain one, which is basically groundwater for the lay public. Now, we haven't started writing that yet, but hopefully, the first thing you could read in this collection of, of domains and ebooks will basically be groundwater written for the lay public. And that means it won't have equations, but it'll show, hopefully have lots of really good diagrams. And then there's a whole domain on groundwater and society. And groundwater and governance, groundwater uh, and regulations, groundwater and, and professional, uh, you know, certification, etc. So, so we're starting off with groundwater as the core, and then basically we're going to interface with the ecologists and everybody else. Groundwater has become kind of trivialized because the ecologists and all these people then who decide they're going to do ecohydrology, and every university across the globe now has ecohydrology, but in many cases, got no groundwater at all. So we're kind of reversing it. We're going to work up from groundwater into all, all of the interfaces. Groundwater and fish, like why do salmon in BC rivers spawn in a particular location? They spawn in a particular location because that's where the groundwater is flowing in with a certain chemistry and temperature, etc. And it's amazing the number of things where groundwater is actually the controlling, the controlling part of the ecological system. Although who, whoever knows that, you know, whoever would know that in an ecology program, and who would ever even teach that in a groundwater program? One of the reasons why I think we're ignored. Okay, well, we have time and we're going to run the first presentation. You will be around in the morning, so yep. yes, uh, after you get in the morning, you can come up. And that's kind of great. Please just see me. Let's see you standing there.